What's up my stat stars? Welcome to the Unit 7 Summer Review video for AP Statistics. I'm Michael Printek and I'm ready to talk to you about everything you need to know that comes out of this unit. Now Unit 7 is over inference for quantitative data focusing on means. Because when you have quantitative data, that's data in numerical form, the most common thing we do with those is, well, find the mean. Okay. So we're gonna be focusing on means in this video for sure, specifically sample means and how we could use sample means to give us some estimates of what the population mean can be. That's what the unit's all about. Now, before we begin, let me give you two big things I wanna tell you. First, this is just a review video. I don't go into every single teeny, teeny, tiny detail from Unit 7. I just try to focus on the big things that you need to know in preparation for your unit exam in class and for the AP Stats exam in May. Second, I created an awesome study guide for you that goes over everything in this unit with tons and tons of practice problems. So if you're interested in that study guide, check out the Ultimate Review Packet at ultimatereviewpacket.com for AP Statistics, and you could download, print, however you want to access the study guide and follow along with me, pausing or just doing the problems all at the end. But the study guide is going to really give you that great practice that you need to be confident in your abilities when it comes to taking a unit test or the AP exam in May. All right, let's get ready to dive right into unit seven. First up is topic 7.1. This is a very short intro topic. Basically just reminds us that samples do one thing really, really well. They vary. Just because you get a sample mean of 7.1 doesn't mean that the population mean is 7.1. We actually have a name for this. It's called sampling variability. That's just the natural variation that exists between the mean of a sample and the population mean. But sometimes people just call this error not an error like you did anything wrong, it's just completely natural error, it's just sampling error. A sample mean is not gonna match the population mean perfectly. Now, this unit covers two huge concepts. First, confidence intervals for a population mean, and second, significance tests for a population mean. Now, both of these concepts hinge on sampling distributions. Now, to build a sampling distribution, you need to know the true population mean and the true population standard deviation, but what if we don't know those things? Well, that doesn't mean the sampling distribution doesn't exist, it still exists, we just have to kind of estimate and think about what it could look like because that sampling distribution is important for us to understand that there are many, 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 many possible sample means out there and ours is just one of them and we really, really, really hope it's close to the population mean, therefore we're pretty accurate that our sample mean is going to help us make some estimates about what that population mean could look like. Now, since everything in Unit 7 hinges on the idea of a sampling distribution, which we usually approximate with a normal distribution, however, in this unit, we're gonna be using the T distribution. Now, the biggest reason for this is that when we are using a sample standard deviation S as an approximation for the standard deviation of the population sigma, the T distribution is just, well, better. It's a little bit more accurate. Now the T distribution is very similar to the normal distribution. The area out on the bottom and left tails is just a little bit bigger. Now, as your sample size increases, your degrees of freedom increase. And now the degrees of freedom directly relates to the different T distributions that are out there. Although there's only one normal model, there's different T distributions for every degree of freedom. And your degrees of freedom is simply your sample size minus one. And as your sample size goes up, the ends of that T distribution gets smaller and smaller and it looks more and more like the normal distribution. But that's the basic reason why we have to use a T distribution in this unit when we're working with means. One more time, it's because we have to use the sample standard deviation S as an approximation for the standard deviation of the population sigma. And think of it as just a twin brother of the normal distribution, but just a little bit more approximate and a little bit more, hmm, Accurate, I guess we could say, when we are using the sample standard deviation S. So topics 7.2 and 7.3 are all focused on constructing a confidence interval to find a population mean. First, let's talk about how to actually construct this confidence interval. It's a four-step process. Let's talk about step one. Step one is naming the test. It's a one sample T interval for a population mean, but then you wanna give some context as to what that population mean you're trying to find is. Step two is checking the conditions to ensure that our sampling distribution can be constructed. 
Condition number one, of course, sample's gotta be random to avoid bias. Condition number two, the size of our sample needs to be less than 10% of the population so we can assume independence. And condition three is that our sample needs to be big enough. Now we are gonna be using that T distribution that I mentioned, but we still need to be big enough. And there's three different ways that a sample could be big enough. First, if the population that the sample was taken from is known to be normal, then any sample size is big enough, even a sample size as small as one. Or if our sample size is 30 or larger and it was taken from a population that was unknown or specifically not normal, then the central limit theorem says we're still good to proceed with a sampling distribution. Now, the other scenario is when our sample size is below 30 and the population is not known or specifically not normal. This does sound like it would be a death sentence. Well, it's not. As long as we check our data, and make sure that there's no major outliers and no major skewness. You could check this with a simple histogram, a dot plot, or a box plot. And if you see no major outliers, no major skewness, we're still allowed to proceed with a sample that's quote unquote big enough. Now the third step to construct a confidence interval for a population mean is to actually construct it, doing the math with this very simple formula. X bar, that's our sample mean, that's gonna be the start, that's gonna be the actual middle of our confidence interval, and from that X bar, we're gonna add, we're gonna subtract our margin of error. The margin of error is the product of two things, the critical value, that's our T star, and the standard error, which is S, the standard deviation of our sample, divided by the square root of our sample size. Now, in a problem, you are either going to be given the mean and the standard deviation of your sample, as long as the sample size, or you're gonna to have to actually calculate it, which means that you're gonna be given the data and you can import that data into your calculator to get the mean and the standard deviation. Now, the only other value that you are gonna to have to find is your critical value T star. Now, you could use what's known as a T table to look that up, or you could use invert T on the TI-84 calculator. Now, when you go to invert T, it's gonna ask you for two things. First, it's gonna want the area at the bottom or the area to the left. So for example, if we're 95% confident, that means 5% of samples are left out, 2.5% at the bottom, and 2.5% at the top. So the area to the left would be that bottom 2.5%, so we'd import 0.025. And then it's also gonna ask for the degrees of freedom, because remember, every sample size has minus one degrees of freedom, and based on the degrees of freedom, you're gonna use a specific T distribution. So make sure you enter your degrees of freedom in as well, which is again, just sample size minus one. That's how you're gonna get your T star. Now the fourth and final step to constructing a confidence interval for a population mean is interpreting what your interval means in context. So we wanna make sure we first start off with stating our level of confidence. So you'd say something like I'm 95% confident that the true population mean of fill in the blank with the context in terms of what you're trying to find. And then that's what the interval is. It's gonna be somewhere between the bottom and the top of that interval. Now, before we dive into an example of exactly what we just went over, let's quickly talk about a couple more details. First, sample size matters. Bigger samples vary less, so bigger samples should be closer to the truth, meaning that when you have a bigger sample, your margin of error is going to shrink and your confidence interval will become more narrow. So, always use bigger samples. They will produce more accurate, smaller confidence intervals. Now, the other thing we could do is adjust our level of confidence. Typically, we use 95. We could also use 96, 98, or 99. Now, the more confident you are, the wider your interval is gonna be because to try to capture more samples, you're going to need to get wider. Now, the best thing you could do is use a high level of confidence, which on the surface sounds like it's gonna make a wider interval, but remember, if you increase your sample size, you're going to be decreasing the size of that interval, becoming more and more accurate. So we love high confidence, but we also love bigger samples because they are more accurate. All right, now let's take a look at a full example of exactly how to construct a confidence interval for a population mean. What is the mean amount of time a name brand AAA battery lasts? To find out, Becky selects a random sample of 55 name brand AAA batteries and runs them each in a flashlight until the flashlight no longer operates. She records the time of the 55 batteries lasted and then calculates the mean and standard deviation of her sample. The mean of her sample was 348.7 minutes with a standard deviation of 23.8 minutes. Construct a 99% confidence interval for the population mean amount of time that the name brand battery lasts. 
Now, the first step is going to actually be, again, naming it in context. This is a one sample T interval for the mean amount of time in minutes that all brand name AAA batteries will last in the particular mentioned flashlight. Try to be as specific as you can when you're doing step one, using that one sample T interval name, but then giving context to what you're trying to find. Step two, the sample of 55 batteries was randomly selected to avoid bias. Condition number two, the sample of 55 name brand batteries is assumed to be less than 10% of all name brand batteries so that we can assume independence. And the third condition is, well, we don't know whether the population is normal or not, it never said, but our sample size is bigger than 30, it's 55, which is bigger than 30, so we are safe to assume that we could use a T distribution to explain the sampling distribution with 54 degrees of freedom. Next comes actually building the interval, which again, I think is the easy part. We're gonna start off with our formula, and on the AP exam, they do love when you show that formula first, X bar plus or minus your T star times S divided by the square root of N. Now we're gonna fill in the mean from our sample, that's our point estimate of 348.7. The standard deviation of our sample is 23.8, and the sample size is 55. The only thing we have to do is go and look up our T star for 54 degrees of freedom and 99% confidence. You could use a T chart, or you could go to invert T on your TID4 calculator. Now, 99% confident puts 1% on the outside, half a percent at the bottom, half a percent at the top. So if we go to that invert T, the area at the bottom is 0 0.005, that represents that half a percent, and then we're gonna type in 54 degrees of freedom, and that's how I got the T star of 2.6700. Now, multiply the T star times your standard error to get the margin of error of 8.569, add and subtract that to the sample mean, and we get a confidence interval of 340.13 to 357.27. Now it's time for that fourth step, interpreting our interval. I'm 99% confident that the population mean time that a name brand AAA battery will last in this flashlight mentioned is somewhere between 340.13 minutes and 357.27 minutes. That's it. That's how simple the four step process can be. Now I do briefly want to go over one more example with you just because some different things can happen when you're working with means. So in this example, doctors try to figure out what is the mean systolic blood pressure for teenage athletes at rest. So he gets a sample of 22 teenage athletes and he gets their systolic blood pressure while they're at rest. Now in this particular problem, it's set up where I'm giving you the data. I'm giving you the actual blood pressures of these 22 male athletes. Now, in this particular case, why I wanted to show you this is because you are gonna to have to enter this data into your calculator to get the sample mean X bar and the standard deviation S. Sometimes those numbers are straight given to you, other times the AP exam likes it for you to go ahead and figure them out on your own. Now, the other problem we have in here is checking our conditions. Because our sample size is 22, which is not bigger than 30, and we don't know that the population is normal. In this case, we are going to have to go ahead and look at a quick graph of our data to ensure that there's no skewness or no major outliers before we can move on. So again, here's a quick look at step one, which is nice and simple, make sure you use context. Step three, gotta be random sample, gotta be under 10% of our population to assume independence, and notice we made a quick graph here just to show that, hey, no major skewness, no major outliers, so we're still safe to proceed even though our sample size is under 30. Then we're gonna go ahead and build the interval using all the data that we found, that's the sample mean and the standard deviation, and then finally, we're gonna go interpret it. I'm 95% confident that the population mean systolic blood pressure for all teenage male athletes is somewhere between 111.47 and 117.80 mmHGs. Now, two more big ideas that come out of these topics over confidence interval for a population mean. First, you need to be able to explain what exactly a particular level of confidence means. So for example, if they say, what does 95% confident even mean in the context to your problem? Well, it's not a probability. A lot of kids will try to say, oh, 95% is the probability that this population mean is in my interval. No, absolutely not. The idea is that the population mean is either in your interval or it's not. There's no probability attached to it. We're 95% confident that it's in there. Now, what does that 95% confident mean? Well, it's all about samples. Remember, that sampling distribution is showing you all possible samples. And we know that, for example, 95% of them are so close to the true mean in the center 
that when we get our sample mean and wrap an interval around it, we should capture the population mean, again, in 95% of samples. So basically it has nothing to do with probability, it has nothing to do with time, it's all about samples. If we look at many, 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 many samples, every sample will produce its own sample mean, and that sample mean would create its own confidence interval. So basically we're gonna have a lot of confidence intervals because every mean has its own confidence interval. In 95% of all of those confidence intervals will contain the true population mean, and 5% unfortunately will not. But those 5% are because of the samples on the far left or on the far right that are extremely unlikely and those type of samples, well, shouldn't happen anyway. So we should be getting a sample mean somewhere in the middle, 95%. So when we wrap a confidence interval around it, we're 95% confident that the true population mean is in our interval. Now, this last big idea is this. Sometimes we like to work a little bit backwards. What I mean by that is we start a problem not by knowing the data, but by knowing the margin of error we want to achieve. Oftentimes, researchers want a very small margin of error because a small margin of error means you're more accurate. Now, how can you achieve a small margin of error? Bigger sample size. So what sample size do we need to achieve a, a, a certain margin of error is a very common question. Now, how do we do this? Well, let's look at an example so I can explain. Marcus wants to estimate the population mean circumference of spherical marbles that his company produces with a 95% confidence interval and a margin of error of only 0.4 centimeters. What sample size would he need to achieve this margin of error? Now, past samples have shown a standard deviation of 1.7 centimeters. All right, so first, we're given the margin of error and we're trying to determine what sample size. So we're gonna use the formula for the margin of error, which is just the back part of our confidence interval idea. It's just the product of T star times the standard error as divided by the square root of n. That's our margin of error. So now we're gonna use this formula for margin of error and just substitute in everything we know. We know the margin of error we want to achieve is 0.4 centimeters, so put a 0.4 on the left. The sample size is gonna stay n, this is exactly what we're solving for. Now, we don't know S, the standard deviation of our sample, because we haven't looked at our sample yet. Marcus is trying to figure out how big the sample needs to be in the first place. But we do have this past information that says past data has shown a standard deviation of 1.7, so we could gladly put that 1.7 there. Now, what about T star? Well, technically, we can't find T star either. We do know 95 is the level of confidence we want, which puts 2.5% at the bottom, but we don't know our degrees of freedom because degrees of freedom comes from sample size and we don't know our sample size. So in this scenario, we are gonna have to go ahead and just use Z star. Now for big samples, the difference between T star and Z star should be pretty small, so we should be safe here, at least to give us a starting point as to what that sample size could be to produce that given margin of error. So the 95% confident Z star is gonna be 1.96, and we can look that up on a Z table or use invert norm. Now all we gotta do is solve this. So we're gonna take the 0.4, divide by the 1.96, then we're gonna multiply the square root of n over to the left-hand side, and then we're gonna divide by the margin of error divided by the 1.96. So now we have s, that's 1.7, divided by the fraction of 0.4 divided by 1.96. All right, now the last thing we gotta do is get rid of that square root, and of course we're gonna square both sides to do that, so if we square everything, we'll get our final answer. In rounding up, we get approximately 70 marbles, and if we look at 70 marbles, we should have a margin of error of roughly 0.4 centimeters. Next up is topic 7.4 and 7.5, which are all about significance tests for a population mean. Now a confidence interval is used because we have no idea what the population mean is and we're trying to use the interval to figure out what it might be. Now in a significance test, we might know or have an idea what the population mean is, but we wanna make a claim that it's something different. Maybe it's something greater, maybe it's something less, or maybe it's just something flat out different. And what we're gonna do is get a sample to either find evidence to support that our claim is true or a lack of evidence and therefore we don't know that our claim is true. Now, the process is fairly simple and it's four steps. Let's walk through each of those four steps right now. The first step of a significance test is the hypothesis. Here we have the null and the alternative hypothesis. But we also wanna make sure in this step we name what we're doing. This is a one sample t-test 
for a population mean. And of course, we want to fill in some context, population mean of what? Now, we also want to define what that population mean is. Maybe it's the average amount of caffeine in a pill, or maybe it's the average amount of caffeine in a cup of coffee, who knows? Now, the null hypothesis is what we say status quo. Everything is the way it should be. The mean that we believe to be true still is in fact true. So we always want to use a mu equals whatever it said it was equal to in the problem. The alternative hypothesis is what we are claiming or what we are wondering. Now there's three options here. We either wonder that the true mean is greater than what it was supposed to be, less than it was supposed to be, or simply not equal to what it was supposed to be. But in the problem, you will read what the population mean is supposed to be, and that number is always used in both the null and the alternative. We never use X bar, and we never use sample means within our hypotheses. The hypotheses are all about the population mean. The null is that it's the same as we think it is, and the alternative is that, whoa, 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 we claim it's more, less, or not equal to. Now, if the Alternative hypothesis is less than or greater than, we call these one-sided tests. One-sided lower if it's less than, one-sided upper if it's greater than. If we just flat out don't care if it's less than or greater than, just that the true population mean is something different, then we call that a two-tailed test because it could be on the upper tail or the bottom tail and we don't really care as long as it's something different. Now, the only difference in what you do is double your p-value if you have a two-tailed test because, you're all, because your alternative is not equal to. So at the very, very end, when you get your p-value, all you got to do is make sure that you times it by two when you're working with a two-sided test. Now, step two of a significant test is to build the sampling distribution on the assumption that the given population mean is in fact true. And we also have to check the conditions for every part of that sampling distribution. So first we're going to say, all right, the mean of all those sample means should be the true population mean that we said it was from the null hypothesis. But that's only gonna be true if we have that condition met that our samples are random to avoid bias. The second thing we need is the standard deviation, but typically we only know S, the standard deviation of our sample, not sigma, the standard deviation of our population, which is why we're gonna use standard error, which is actually gonna make this a T distribution instead of a normal distribution. Remember those T distributions are just a little bit more approximate and a little bit more mm, accurate when we only know S, the standard deviation of our sample. Now, to utilize this form, then we do have to have independence, so we do have to check that our sample size is less than 10% of the population, so we could assume independence. Lastly, we need that shape to be that, that approximate T distribution, and for that, again, we gotta check one of three different parts. First, we need to be big enough, and we can be big enough because the population that we're drawing from is already known to be normal. In that case, any sample size is big enough, or if our sample size is 30 or over, the central limit theorem says that our sampling distribution is already big enough, so we're good to go. The other scenario that we've already talked about in this video is if your population is unknown and your sample size is under 30, then what we need to do is really check our data very quickly and make sure there's no major skewness and no major outliers, and then we could still proceed. So building that sampling distribution and finding the center, the spread, and the shape is really important in step two of a significance test. All right, the third step of a significance test is to get that p-value. But how do we get that p-value? Well, we gotta do a couple things. First, we need our x-bar. We need the mean of our sample. That's either gonna be given to us in the problem, or we're gonna have to calculate it based on some data given to us. Now, what we really need to do is locate where that sample mean falls in our sampling distribution that we built back in step two. Now, to do that, we're gonna need a t-score. Why not a z-score? Well, remember, we're using a t-distribution to represent that sampling distribution, so we're gonna use a t-score. But the good news is, the formula for a t-score, no different than a z-score. So we're gonna take our sample mean x-bar, we're gonna subtract the assumed to be true population mean from our null hypothesis, and we're gonna divide by our standard error, which is s divided by the square root of n. Once we have our t-score, we could figure out our p-value, which is the probability that any other sample mean is more extreme than the one we found, given that the null hypothesis is true. Now, to find that p-value, we're gonna use t-CDF, well, not normal CDF, because we're, again, using the t-distribution. So we go to t-CDF, we're going to choose an upper or a lower value. Now be careful here, make sure that if you have a positive 
T-score, we're gonna have the lower value be that positive T-score, and then we're gonna go as an upper value of 99, acting like infinity, looking way above it. But if we have a negative T-score, we're gonna have that be our upper value, and the lower value is gonna be negative 99, looking way below. Because when we say the p-value is the probability of our simple mean occurring or more extreme, that means if we're positive, we're even more positive, even higher, even bigger. If we're negative, we're even lower, even more negative. All right, then the other thing you do need to add in there is the degrees of freedom, because remember, there's a different t-distribution for every different sample size, and they're based on the degrees of freedom, simply sample size minus one. That's gonna give you your p-value. And one more time, I really wanna make sure that you know what a p-value is. It is the probability of any other sample mean being more extreme than the one we observed, given that the null hypothesis is true, because that's how we built our sampling distribution on that null hypothesis being true. The fourth and final step is giving our conclusion. Now, this is gonna go down two paths. If your p-value is below your level of significance for a problem, typically we use one or 5%. So if your p-value is less than your level of significance, then that means we are going to reject the null hypothesis and claim that we do have evidence that the alternative is true. Basically what we're saying is that the sample we found was extremely unlikely. And when something extremely unlikely happens, there's gotta be a reason why, and that reason is that the population mean we were assuming to be true is wrong, and the alternative hypothesis is correct. Just make sure you say all of that in context. Now, the other path is if our p-value is greater than our level of significance. In this case, we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Don't ever say accept the null hypothesis. We still, don't, we still don't know that the null hypothesis is in fact true. We just don't have the evidence to say that it's wrong. Basically, our sample was so close to the population mean that we assume to be true that we can't officially say that gives us evidence that the population mean is, well, wrong. It doesn't mean we're saying it's right. That's why we say we failed to reject the null hypothesis. We just don't know for sure that it's wrong. And make sure again that you say that in context. And well, that's it. Those are the four steps to doing a significant test for a population mean. Let's look at an example real quick. The makers of a popular caffeine pill want to make sure that their caffeine tablets are being made with the proper amount of caffeine in them. Now, when the machine is operating perfectly, there should be a mean amount of 220 milligrams in every tablet. Now, the manager of the plant is concerned that maybe the tablets are being made with too little caffeine, which would kind of be a big problem. So she decides to get a random sample of 35 tablets, find the sample mean and the sample standard deviation, and investigate. Does her data provide significant evidence at the 5% level that the machine is working improperly and that the mean amount of caffeine in the tablets is less than 220 milligram? Let's walk through the four steps to find out. First, we're going to identify the hypotheses and the name of the test. This is a one sample t-test for the population mean amount of caffeine in these tablets produced by this company. The null hypothesis is that the population mean mu is 220 milligrams. It's not any different than what it should be. The alternative is what we're wondering and the plant manager wonders that there might be too little caffeine in the pills. So she would have an alternative hypothesis that the population mean mu is less than 220 milligrams. Now step two is building the sampling distribution and checking all those conditions for it. So first, let's check the conditions. The sample of 35 has to be random to avoid bias. We could assume that 35 tablets is less than 10% of all tablets from the entire company produces to assume independence. And 35 is bigger than 30, so we are safe to use a sampling distribution, but we are gonna have to use a T distribution with 34 degrees of freedom. Why are we using a T distribution one more time? Because we do not know the population standard deviation, we only know S, the standard deviation of our sample. Now, the center of this sampling distribution is gonna be the mean of all the X bars, and that should be 220, because we have to assume the null hypothesis is true. Now, the standard deviation, well, remember, I can't calculate the standard deviation because I don't know sigma, I only know S, so we're gonna to have to use standard error, so we're gonna take S divided by the square root of our sample size, 35. And finally, the shape should be that T distribution, which looks a lot like the normal distribution. 
Now, the mean of the sample of 35 tablets was 218 milligrams, and the standard deviation was 3.2. We don't use the sample mean anywhere in step two, but we do need S, the standard deviation of our sample, to get that standard error. So we're gonna take that 3.2 divided by the square root of our sample size, 35. Now, for step three, this is where it gets fun. We gotta calculate our p value. Now, the first thing we gotta do is identify where our sample mean falls within that sampling distribution. So we're gonna take 218, we're gonna subtract the mean that was supposed to be true from the null hypothesis, 220, and we're gonna divide it by that standard error, which is that 3.2 divided by the square root of 35. Now that's gonna give us our t-score that tells us specifically where our mean falls on the model. And that T-score is negative 3.697, which just at a quick look at does seem pretty low. But we do need to find the P-value. Now this is the probability that any other sample mean is more extreme than the one we found, which was 218. So we're gonna find the probability that an X-bar is less than 218 milligrams. But that's gonna be the same probability as the area below a T-score of negative 3.697. So to find that area, we're gonna go ahead and use a TCDF. We're gonna look way down, so we're gonna start a lower value of negative 99 and go to an upper value of negative 3.697. And we do need to type in that 34 degrees of freedom for this very specific T distribution. And we get a p-value of 0 0.000382. So it's a very unlikely probability that we get a sample mean as extreme or more extreme than the one that we found. And that kind of tells us something right there. Now step four is gonna actually be making the conclusion. So because my p-value of 0 0.000382 is less than my alpha level of 0.05, I will reject the null hypothesis. There is significant evidence that the mean of the population, the mean of all the amount of caffeine in these tablets is less than 220 milligrams. I don't know exactly what the mean is, I just know that my sample says that it's more than likely less than 220 milligrams. So we should shut down production, fix the machines, or else we're gonna be producing tablets that don't have the proper amount of caffeine in them. Now the only other thing I wanna mention for a second time is if your alternative hypothesis is not equal to, this is called a two-sided test, and in this case, whatever we get for our p-value, we're just going to times it by two and then make our conclusion. Hopefully that makes a lot of sense. Now there's just two more things I wanna mention, and that is of course the possibility of error. Now we talked about error back in unit six already, but let's run through it one more time. Type one error is when the null hypothesis is true, but the mistake is we reject it and we think the alternative is true. So we claim that we have evidence that the alternative is correct, but that's actually wrong, and the null hypothesis is in fact true. A type two error is when the alternative hypothesis is true, but we don't conclude that. So the error is that we failed to reject the null, so we keep a null that's, well, wrong. Now, type one and type two errors, you're never going to have to determine if they actually occur or not. It's really more of a theoretical thing. So any time that you reject the null hypothesis, like we just did in that example, and the alternative, we claim that the alternative is true, well, if we reject the null hypothesis, we say, what if it was true? That means we're at risk of a type one error. Because what if that null hypothesis is true and our sample is just a weird one that led us down the wrong direction? Don't worry about if it happened or not, but there's just the possibility of it. Anytime you fail to reject the null hypothesis, you are at risk of a type two error because maybe you're keeping a null hypothesis that's, well, wrong and you should be going with the alternative. So just make sure you have an understanding of these type one and type two errors in your head and the idea that they could happen, but you don't need to worry about it in the middle of a problem if you made one of these errors or not. Now, the only other thing that piggybacks off of errors is power. Power is a good thing. Power is the probability of correctly rejecting a false null hypothesis and going with a true alternative hypothesis. And we always want more power. The easiest way in the world to get more power is to increase your sample size. A bigger sample is always gonna be more accurate and it's always gonna give you a better idea of what you're looking at and it's gonna make sure that you know you're more accurate. So if you have a bigger sample size, you should be getting a result that's more accurate to the truth. And if the truth is that the alternative is correct, a bigger sample will help us see that so we can go and reject that false null.
Next up is topic 7.6 and 7.7. .7. These two topics focus on creating a confidence interval for the difference of two means. Now, basically we're gonna follow the same four steps that we did for confidence intervals for a single mean. The first step is going to be identifying what it is, and it's called a two sample t-test for the difference of population means. And then we're gonna actually go ahead in step two and check those conditions, which are gonna sound really, really familiar, but we do have to make sure that all those conditions are true for both samples, because we got a sample from population one and a sample from population two. The third step is gonna actually be building the confidence interval utilizing this formula, which overall isn't too, too bad. And we'll take a look in example so we can see how it all works. And the third step is interpreting your interval. Now, when you interpret your interval, you just gotta be a little extra careful here. You just gotta make sure that we understand we're comparing the difference between two different samples. And I think the best way to tackle all of this is just look at examples. Let's dive right into one right now. Wildlife researchers are interested in finding the difference in tree sizes between oak trees that grow in the northern states and oak trees that grow in the southern states. To estimate this difference, the researchers analyzed 40 random oak trees from the north and 40 from the south, and they measured the diameters in inches of each of those trees at a height two feet from the ground. Here are the statistics from each sample. Of the 40 trees from the north, the mean was 36.6 inches, and the standard deviation from the trees in the north was 12.8. The mean for the trees in the south is 28.9 inches and the standard deviation 15.4. Let's create a 95% confidence interval for the difference between the mean diameter of oak trees in the north and oak trees in the south. So step one is just naming it. This is a two sample T interval for the difference between the mean diameter of oak trees in the northern states and southern states. So making sure that we have the proper name, two sample T interval for the difference, and then the difference between what? Like don't believe it generic, actually talk specific. So the population mean diameter of oak trees in the north versus oak trees in the south. All right, step two is actually checking those conditions. Both samples have to be random to avoid bias. Both samples have to be less than 10% of the population so we can assume independence. And both samples have to be big enough. Now, how do we know we're big enough? Well, again, you guys should know all that by now, but since both samples were 40, 40 is bigger than 30, so our sampling distribution is A-OK -okay to proceed. Definitely gonna be big enough. All right, now is the actual fun part, actually building the interval with this formula. Now there are lots of numbers here, so please make sure that you keep all of your data organized so you get everything in the right place. Now, it doesn't matter the order you subtract the means. You could do the south minus the north or the north minus the south. But I'm a positive person, so it does make sense in my mind to always do it in a direction that produces positive result. Now, our sample from the north was on average bigger than our sample from the south, so I'm gonna start off with our sample from the north. So I'm gonna take the 36.6, and subtract the 28.9. Now I just gotta keep in mind that I did north minus south. Now from that difference that we observed, I'm gonna add and subtract my margin of error. So first I need my T star for 95% confident. So I'm gonna go to invert T, I'm gonna type in the area at the bottom. Remember if I'm 95% confident, the area at the bottom is that 2.5% at the bottom. Now here's the next problem though. How many degrees of freedom do I have? Well, this is where things get a little bit tricky. First, when you are working with two samples, the formula for degrees of freedom is really, really ugly. It is way more complicated than just sample size minus one, like it is for a single sample. So in a lot of cases, we do not use the proper official formula for degrees of freedom for two samples. We do one of two things, both are fully accepted on the AP exam. One, we could get the degrees of freedom for each sample and use the smaller of the two. So since our sample sizes are both 40, that means both of them have 39 degrees of freedom and the smaller of them are, well, still 39, so we would use 39 degrees of freedom. The other option that the AP exam does fully recognize as correct is getting the addition of those two degrees of freedom. So taking 39 degrees of freedom from the first sample from the north, 39 degrees of freedom from the second sample from the south, adding those together for your total degrees of freedom. Now, I personally like to use the smaller of the two, but my answer will never be that dramatically different than somebody who adds the two degrees of freedom together. Or if somebody actually uses the official formula for degrees of freedom and is way more accurate than any of us, it's still all gonna be close enough that we're gonna have a same final result that's not that different. So I'm gonna use a T star based on 39 degrees of freedom. 
And that's how I got the 2.0227. Now for my standard error. Now this is where you gotta really make sure you get all your numbers in the right place. For the standard deviation of the north, that was the 12.8 squared divided by 40. Standard deviation from the south, 15.4 squared divided by 40. Add all that variance together inside, and then put a giant square root on all that to get my standard error. Now, multiplying all that together in the back, we get a margin of error 6.404. So I observed a difference of 7.7 .7 inches in favor of the north being bigger, but it could be more, it could be less. I'm gonna add and subtract that margin of error, and I get 1.196 to 14.004. Now comes time for what I think is actually the trickiest part, and that's interpreting this confidence interval. Now, you could be super generic and just say, I'm 95% confident that the interval from 1.20 inches to 14.00 inches contains the true difference between the mean diameter of trees in the north and trees in the south. But I think it makes way more sense to be a little bit more specific in terms of comparing. Anytime you're looking at two things, we want to compare them. So, I like to say this, I'm 95% confident that oak trees from the northern states have a mean diameter anywhere from 1.20 inches to 14.00 inches bigger than oak trees in the south. My entire interval was positive, and the way that I subtracted my means was north minus south. And my interval stayed positive, and a positive result means that the north must be bigger. So my interval tells me that the north could be anywhere from 1.2 inches bigger on average to 14.00 inches bigger on average than oak trees in the south. Now that conclusion or that interpretation to me makes a lot more sense because it's comparing what we're finding. We don't know what the true difference is between the mean diameter of oak trees in the south and the north, but we are pretty confident, 95%, that the ones in the north are gonna be on average bigger, anywhere from 1.2 inches to 14.0 inches bigger. Now something else that comes out of these two topics is being able to once again justify claims using a confidence interval. Now this is where that interval really, really makes sense if you interpret it properly. Now, think about it like this. Let's just say somebody claims that oak trees in the north are definitely bigger. Does our confidence interval support that? Yes, remember, our confidence interval was entirely positive, so we could definitely say that our data supports the fact that on average, oak trees in the north are bigger than oak trees in the south because the entire interval was positive, showing that the north is gonna be bigger. But let's just play a what if game. What if our interval was something along the lines of positive four to negative two? Okay. That means that we would be 95% confident that oak trees in the north could be anywhere from four inches bigger to two inches smaller on average. Now that interval contains zero, which also means that there possibly could be no difference, a big beautiful zero, no difference between our two population means. So if that was the case and we were said, hey, uh, we believe or we claim that oak trees in the north are bigger, we would have to say our interval doesn't support that because our interval actually shows that oak trees in the north could be bigger, could be smaller, or it could be completely no different than oak trees in the, in the south. So it's important that you understand what happens when zero falls in your interval, especially when you're looking at differences. Because when zero falls in your interval, it means that there could very well be no difference. So make sure you're very careful in answering any types of claims or, or justifying claims using your interval based on those ideas. Finally, in unit seven, we have topic 7.8 and topic 7.9, which are all about setting up and conducting a significance test for the difference between two population means. All right, we're gonna follow the same basic four steps to doing a significance test. Step one, the name and hypothesis. Step two, building the sampling distribution on the assumption that the null hypothesis is true and checking all those fun conditions. Step three, calculating that p-value. And then step four, making our conclusion based on that p-value. Now, the four steps here are nice and simple, not overly difficult, but I do think it'd be best to explain those four steps as we look through an example. All right, in this example, we wonder, do people who exercise frequently, on average, have a lower resting heart rate than those who don't exercise? To investigate this, Melissa selected a random sample of 10 people who claim to exercise four or more times a week for more than one hour. She also selected a random sample of eight people who never exercise at all. The results of their resting heart rates are in the table below. So here we have all of the data for our exercise group, all of the data for our non-exercise group. 
Now we see that the mean of the exercise group was lower than the mean of the non-exercise group, but we gotta look at it like this. There's two reasons why we could be seeing a difference between these two samples. Reason number one, they're just samples. That's what samples do, they vary. It doesn't mean anything. We could do this whole data investigation again and we'd get the exercise group to have a higher average heart rate than the non-exercise group. It's just random because that's what samples do. Or maybe we're on to something and that it is true that the average resting heart rate of those that exercise is really lower than those that do not. So now we have to investigate which of those two reasons it is. So, does the data provide significant evidence that people who exercise have lower resting heart rates on average than those who do not at the 1% significance level? All right, so step one is naming the test and giving those hypotheses. This is a two sample T test for the difference between the mean resting heart rate of people that exercise and people who do not. Making sure you give that name in context is really important. Now, our null, our null hypothesis is that the mean for those who exercise is, well, no different than the mean that don't. It's exactly the same. The two population means are the same. The alternative is clearly that we're wondering that the mean for those that exercise is less than the mean for those that don't exercise. Now, in other problems, you might end up be using a greater than sign, or maybe you don't care that one group is higher or lower than the other, you just care that they're different. And you can use a not equal to sign as well. But again, that's where you gotta read your problem. All right, step two is actually building that sampling distribution based on the null hypothesis being true in checking all those conditions. So let's check those conditions real quick. Both samples have to be random to avoid bias. Both samples have to be less than 10% of their respective population that they were taking from, so we could assume independence. And, well, we need to be big enough. Now, at first glance, both samples are not big enough. Eight and nine, or excuse me, eight and 10 are not big enough samples. They're not over 30. And we don't know that the populations are normal, or at least it didn't say that. So this is where we'd once again have to make some quick histograms or dot plots or box plots of our two samples of data and make sure there's no major outliers and no major skewness. Now I will be honest, in problems like this where there is quite a bit of, quite a bit of work and quite a bit of time involved in that work, the AP exam loves giving you that little parentheses that says assume all conditions are met. So if you have that written down in the problem, assume all conditions are met, then it's kind of like a free ticket that you don't have to check all these conditions, which is kind of nice when they do that for you. Now we actually have to build that sampling distribution on the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So the center of the sampling distribution would be that the mean of all possible sample mean differences is, well, zero. If they're the same, the difference should be zero. Now the standard deviation is what we'd rather be using, but we can't. We only know the standard deviation S of our samples, so we have to use standard error, which is of course why we're gonna use a T distribution here. So the standard error formula for our sample differences is gonna be the square root of 7.0309 squared divided by 10. That was the standard deviation for those that do exercise plus 4.9839 squared, that was the standard deviation for those who don't exercise, divided by eight, and we get 2.8369. Now the other question is, how many degrees of freedom do we have? Like I said before, we have two options. We could use the smaller of the two. So one sample has nine degrees of freedom, one sample has seven, so we could use seven degrees of freedom, which is what I'm gonna do. Or we could take that nine and that seven, add them together to get 16 degrees of freedom. Gonna have some slight different numbers at the end, especially with your p-value, but it won't be big enough that it'll cause any kind of big mistakes, and the AP exam acknowledges that. All right. Next step is actually locating our observed difference in our model. Now our observed difference was 60.1 minus 79.625. We observed a difference of 19.525. Now that's negative. Why is it negative? Well, because I subtracted them with a smaller number minus a bigger number. It actually doesn't matter the order you subtract them as long as you understand what happened and what happened was that our group that exercises had a lower heart rate on average lower resting heart rate so whether you get positive or negative it doesn't matter but if you get positive when you go and find your p-value you want to look above it since i got a negative i want to look below it as long as you understand that that's super important so take that difference subtract zero because we assume there was no difference and we're going to divide by the standard error to get negative 6.8825 and just at first glance that's a really low t-score 
Now we're going to find our p-value, which is the probability that any other difference between a sample from those that exercise minus a sample that don't exercise is less, meaning more extreme, than my difference of negative 19.525. Now, like I said, if you subtract in the other order, you got a positive, you would just be looking greater than because now you're looking for the difference to be bigger because your value was larger, positive. Hopefully that makes sense. Having proper notation for your p-value is really, really important. I can't emphasize that enough. So make sure you understand how I wrote that. P for probability, x bar minus x bar, that's the difference between our two means is more extreme, less than the observed difference that we add of negative 19.525. Now, to find that, I'm gonna to go to my sampling distribution and look at the area below that T-score of negative 6.8825. Using TCDF with seven degrees of freedom, I get a very low probability of 0 0.0001175. So now I'm gonna make my conclusion. Since my p-value 0.0001175 is less than 0.01, I'm gonna reject the null hypothesis. I always like to make sure you lead off with the comparison of your p-value to your alpha level. That is a requirement on the AP exam. Now, what does this mean in context? This means that there is significant evidence that the mean resting heart rate of people who exercise regularly is lower than the mean resting heart rate of people that do not exercise. I found out that my difference, the observed difference, wasn't just like a little bit lower, it was really, really big difference, which means I do have significant evidence that I can officially say that the resting heart rate of people that exercise is smaller than the resting heart rate of people that don't. All right, that's it for my unit summary over unit seven. There is a lot in unit seven. We got conference intervals, we got significance tests, we got tons of stuff, and I didn't cover everything. I promise you, I just tried to show you a couple examples of everything, but there's always more examples, and always more examples produce different situations and different scenarios. So please, experience more examples through practicing. That's why I really encourage you to get the ultimate review packet so you can get the study guide for unit seven. It's got tons of practice. You get a practice sheet that's getting gotten more practice so you can see all the different things that can happen when you follow these steps. But hopefully in this video, you learned about the basic steps for confidence intervals and significance tests and how to actually conduct them so you could go and try some on your own. All right, see you guys in the next video.